Yes. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please give a very warm Duns and Scottish Borders welcome to Sir Jackie Stewart. <laughs> Sir Jackie, first of all, lovely to have you back in Duns. It's a, a place you've come to know very well. Give us your, your first impressions on this uh, wonderful new motor museum in the town. Well, first of all, it's great to be back in Scotland again, but to be back down here in Downs has got many happy memories. Apart from Jimmy, I came down here to shoot clay pigeon shooting when I was almost a wee boy. Not much taller now, actually. <laughs> but, but uh, of course, when Jim Clark was racing, he was my hero and forever will be. He was certainly the best racing driver I ever raced against in my entire life. And we had a great life together. And he was a, an enormous help to me. And he caught, taught me so much about the business. And uh, the manner in which he drove racing cars was just different than everybody else. So I had somebody very good to learn from. And we were close friends. I came down, and obviously, to Chermside and so forth. And we shared an apartment together in London, uh, which was... Uh, a busy time because Jim Clark, uh, some of you girls tried to take advantage of a poor racing driver from the borders, but we had a lovely time. It's the, the museum is a, a fitting tribute to the success of, of such a, a skillful sportsman and a very humble man as well. Yes, I would obviously like to congratulate the councillors and everybody who's responsible for being able to bring enough money together to do something as nice as this. And really, you should all be very proud of it. And I think a lot more folk are going to come up now to Duns to see it. Because this goes around the world. Formula One is a global sport. And, and therefore, anybody who knows anything about it clearly knows the name Jim Clark. So I think they're going to attract more people here because it's so well done. It's beautiful. I mean, the Scottish stone, everything. Never mind what's inside it. Uh, so I think you're going to have a great success from it. Um, I think it's beautifully done. I mean, the attention to detail, something that I'm very fond of, has been very carefully looked after. And I'm sure everybody in Scotland, I think the Scottish Government should be well pleased that they've got something as important as this down in the borders. So um, really, I don't think you could have done a better job. I want to, to take you back to that very first time that you met Jim face to face. Now you were thinking right and saying you were poor, Jim had been under arrest and be thankful he was coming down, he then parked up at your father's garage. You recognised this familiar figure in the garage and you headed from the house to, to meet him for the first time. Even then you were very much aware that you were about 19 years old at the time of this man's ability and his skills and what he was perhaps capable of. I think actually it was even younger than that, um, and uh, our garage was in a useful spot to stop taking petrol, and he was coming down, and I had made it this so he was learning a TR2, a TR, a TR2 at the time, that he was actually in that day. Um, so I ran out of the house when I saw him driving in, because I, my mother's house, my father's house was right next to the garage, so I went down there to see him, and just was able to talk to him, and at that time he was just growing to be the driver later turned out to be, but he was still already a recognised and something special. So that was the very beginning, and after that, Graham Gold, who's here today, um, brought me down to Chelsea and Jimmy's, um, stayed with Jimmy once or twice, uh, 
Really, there was a nice, at these days there was a camaraderie about motor racing. The Formula One people were all close together. We were all close friends. We travelled together. Jimmy and I and Helen holidayed together. So it was a much different thing than it is today. Everybody's now got their own helicopters and their own jets, so you never see them uh, spending any time together socially. Uh, although in Monte Carlo, and Alan McNish is here today, another great Scot, who won it and so forth, uh, there's a great community down there, but I don't think they had any right to say depth of friendship that we had in our day. But of course it was considerably more dangerous than the day the fortune died, it was a dangerous sport. So therefore we had a high respect for each other, there was no taking advantage the wrong way. And if you did it, you got a bollock um, at the, the end of the practice session or the end of the race from the Grand Prix Drivers Association. Uh, it was a, a much closer group of people. So um, I think they were the halcyon days. I love Grand Prix racing. I still go to eight or ten Grand Prix races. I'm leaving this afternoon to go to Spa for the Grand Prix. But there isn't anything close to the friendship, that, whether it was Graham Hill and Jimmy or... Daddy Hall, all the boys, we, we were really close to them. You referred there uh, to the, the, the closeness, that uh, bond that you had. You were suggesting there was almost a bond between a number of the drivers. Of course, you, you lived together in, in the embassy in London, as you fondly referred to it. And you learned from that that Jim was incredibly decisive in a racing car. But the complete opposite when you were in a social setting. How many films in the 60s did you miss out on because he couldn't decide which one to go to? He was completely hopeless. Whether it was a restaurant, whether it was a, whether it was a theater we were going to, and we, we would always end up by the damn thing having started and closed the door before we ever got there. Most indecisive man I've ever met. Um, we shared an apartment together, Sir so John Whitmore uh, gave us it, so we're two Scots and we didn't pay a bean for it. Uh, two bedrooms, a lovely apartment. Um, Sally Stokes is here today, the great girlfriend of, of Jimmy's. And had Jim Clark ever married, I fear that she would have married Jim Clark, or he would have married her, I'm not quite sure. But, uh, I have to say, Sally, that you weren't the only one. Uh, Jim Clark was one of the cleverest guys I've ever met in my life. He had a lot of girlfriends. And his great school was that every single one of them thought they were the only one. Now that was much more powerful than winning world championships. He had that uh, allure about him quite clearly. But also, you used him as a sounding board in your early days when you were thinking about two-seater to one-seat single-seater cars, and you were always looking for his, his advice or, or to try and get a, a reaction from him if you, if you posed a question that would potentially determine which direction you would go in. Absolutely. When Ken Till gave me the opportunity of testing a Formula 3 car in 1964, um, I don't know what to do. My ideal would have been to drive a John Coombs jacket uh, or a knee tight at that time. And he gave me this chance and I didn't know whether to go to Goodwood or not, so I phoned Jimmy. And he said to me very clearly, if you want to be a racing driver, you've got to drive single seaters. And if you're going to have to drive single seaters, you've got to start at the bottom. And the best man in the world you could go to is Ken Till. And that was Jimmy who was saying that. So I did go to Goodwood. I did get the drive. And that was 64. I was going to win the European and British Championship. I got it three that year. But it meant that I then got into Formula One the next year. And that was when we even got an opportunity to be really close because we were traveling around the world together. That was something we all did. We went to the same hotels, we went to the same planes, we went everywhere together. And I learned so much from I mean, the Lotus car is, and definitely was the fastest 
race car on the ground. And that, and no question about it. It's better than a Ferrari, better than a BRM. It, it was the best car. But it was also the most fragile. Colin Chapman made cars that were lighter than everybody else's. Uh, and more people died in a Lotus Formula One car than any other car. Um, but not yet, because it was so smooth and so clean and dry. And that's where I learned by following Jimmy in 1960, by, I think, I'm very second to Jimmy, two or three or four times, and just to be, just to see him not taking anything out of the car, not abusing the car. So many people were kind of heavy handed to try and go quicker. Jimmy never did that. And that's why these cars were so successful. No one else was that successful in the world as Jim Clark. And he was great, he had great teammates. And Peter Allen was a great teammate. Many more. Great help too. So uh, Jimmy's technique of driving. And it's not something that he learned, it was something that was natural. It's just a very good natural driver. And, uh, you know, I still say, as I said at the beginning, he is the best racing driver I've ever raced against. Fangio is probably my ultimate hero in the Argentinian, but uh, I didn't race against him, so I never saw the skills that I saw from Jim Clark. What was it like sharing the podium with Jim? Because you'd be competing, gradually making your, your name in, in Formula One yourself, beginning to, to ch challenge for world titles, your first title of course coming in 69. But that experience of being on a podium with Jim and celebrating a success with Jim, because by then you had, the two of you were almost intrinsically linked in terms of sort of the success of, of Scottish motorsport, these iconic figures in, in the sport. Well, um, my first year in Formula 1, the Belgian Grand Prix was one of the early races, the South African Grand Prix was before that, of course, which was the first race of the season. Uh, Jimmy won that, and I was way back, I was sixth. Um, but by the time we got to Spa, uh, Spa Francorchamps in those days was with the Nürburgring, the big challenge. And I had never been there before, and did reasonably well in, in practice because there was no qualifying and it was strict in practice. Um, but the, every lap was timed. And um, I was always asking Jimmy what to do and what not to do. And the race was in pouring rain and Jimmy ran away. Um, and I was the only person that sort of kept up with him, but 25 seconds behind him. And, uh, and I finished the race in second place. We lapped the entire field, just the two of us. And I got to the podium and I said, oh, thank God you're all right. I, I was just in fear that you were going to be trying too hard. And that sort of friendship, you know, got deeper and deeper. So that's why I was on the worst of the thing. So his smoothness was what was really his great talent. He never stressed the car. He, he was very smooth with it, very clean with it. Well, thank you very much for your thoughts. We'll, we'll just uh, keep Sir Jackie here for the moment. I wonder if I can uh, call forward uh, Alan McNish, uh, who's uh, one of the uh, special guests here along with Sir Jackie this afternoon. Alan, come into the body of the Kirk, sir. Alan, great. So you've been back here in Duns. I remember you, you coming here like it was 2015 to take part in a, a, a you know, very special event to, to mark uh, Jimmy's success in 1965 Formula One title in Indianapolis as well. Of course, you're synonymous with success at Le Mans. Way back in the, the very early days of, of Jim Clark and his experience as a driver, he also took part in, in Le Mans. So you have that, that connection as well. His time in Le Mans isn't spoken about quite so much, but clearly that was an early indication of, of how uh, experienced the driver he was and how he could adapt to different cars and tracks and situations. Yeah, I think that's exactly the point, was uh, the adaptability, because Le Mans is a 24-hour race, it's the equivalent of about 17 Formula One Grand Prix back-to-back, -back. so nearly a season of racing a day, and uh, it does, you do have to adapt, and 
he was there, he was able to do it, but if you just go inside the museum, you've got, uh, you talked about the Indy 500 victory in 65, you also can say the Formula 1 World Championship, then you've got a Lotus Cortina inside, and all of them are different animals and different characters. And I would refer a little bit back to what Jackie said earlier on about uh, the field and the fact he was never pushing the car, he was just guiding the car through. And that's something that I heard about as a child round about the dining room table with my dad talking about Jim Clark and how he was able to do things with cars that others couldn't. And that adaptability and skill is something that I think really he had at a level that we don't often see, certainly not today, that is for sure. Today's character and drivers are very, very different and maybe not in that same skill set. Growing up here in Berwickshire, of course, he had some great testing grounds in Winfield and of course Winfield did very quickly rise to become one of the iconic circuits in the very early 50s and then Charter Hall as well and, and Sir Jackie, you'll have memories of, of competing at uh, Charter Hall on one of the, the very early occasions you would meet Jim post that visit to your dad's garage would be down at Charter Hall. Uh, uh, yes, but I never raced against him. He was driving a rush and the right by that time was uh, driving a Porsche. Uh, I don't know what it was, a 19, what do you call it? A, a little, little touring car. Uh, and or I was driving a new type, or I was driving a Mark II Jaguar, or I was driving a Marcos. But back in Italy, when Jim was racing and I was there at the same time, Jim was already a big name. Uh, you know, ever knew Jim Clark in these days. So, Charter Hall was a very important place, and a lot of drivers came from Charter Hall to greater things. So it's a shame we don't have a Charter Hall or a Winfield, which is not too far away from here either. Uh, and I used to go there as a spectator, as a wee boy, my autograph, which I've still got. Um, so Charter Hall made a lot of Scottish racing drivers come to the very top. Alan, and then those would be two circuits you would hear about around that time of day, because I'd imagine a lot of the discussion was around that time where there was, there was the, this growth in motorsport and so many characters from almost an arc in Scotland if you look from the, the Scottish borders up and through Lanarkshire past Sir Jackie and the Martin down towards the, the South West. It's quite incredible. Just that pocket of Scotland alone, the success that has come in many of them of a particular vintage would enjoy success at a charter hall. Do you sometimes wish that that was open to you as a, a younger driver? Well, I'd say the first thing was that uh, I was very fortunate that I had the likes of Jim Clark and Sir Jackie Stewart to look up to, and also that we had in Scotland the stories around about the dining room table to inspire the young drivers and also the families to go along and to try to emulate and bring along some more success. And I think in reality, Jim Clark kick-started a lot of drivers' careers that have actually been here, seen the museum, but never necessarily met Jim, just because of the fact that he put the place on the map. He put Duns on the map and he put Scotland on the map. So Jackie then took it forward and guided, I would say, my generation of driver being Dario Franchitti, David Coulthard, myself, and he guided us in the same sort of way. And that's something that Scotland's got, and you were talking about it with Jim, having a real sort of connection and a, a familiar, familiarity. I think we do look after our own. I think we do support our own, and I think the fact that so many people are here today says we are. We don't necessarily have the same circuit opportunities, but we do have a lot of determination, and I would say a very family feel about ourselves, and that's been a big part of my career growth. And again, I suppose that the motor museum that we have just uh, behind us, a perfect illustration of how to recognise the, the talents and the, the broad range of uh, ability that he, he had to tackle so many different disciplines in a car as well. It's all captured in here. That can't be easy to do given the, the, the widespread of success he had over more than a decade. Not without a shadow of a doubt, and also at the level um, set 65. You know, I was very fortunate to be able to drive his Formula 1 World Championship winning car down the street here in Sir Jackie to wave the chequered flag at the end. But if you think about that, he won the Indy 500 that year, he won the Formula 1 World Championship, and he also won uh, the Tasman Series and the Formula 2. And, you know, that's a pretty big haul of trophies, and I think a lot of them you will see inside. And you'll see the story of his life and career going through it. 
And that is, a, is without a shadow of a doubt, one of, uh, I would say, the highlights is ability to be able to do the different types of races, the different skill set that it requires, but to do it so effortlessly. And uh, that's something I think that so many people, you mentioned, you followed in a few races. I think there are so many people actually followed the tailpipes of some of these cars that are inside the museum today. I can see Sir Jackie just uh, around about uh, with Ian Scott Watson just standing about 10, 20 feet or so away from you just now. Such an important figure in getting uh, Jim Clark into a, 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 a racing car, into a car to actually test how fast he was. You always need somebody at the very beginning maybe to give you that kick start. Well, that man there, uh, I don't know if Jim Clark would ever have had the desire to go south and drive racing cars and then drive with this man, uh, because it was he who got everybody's, uh, some ridiculous little car that you owned, it was a, some German thing. Uh, what is it called? Oh, I don't even know the car's name, I'm so young. Um, but no, Ian has a lot to answer for uh, in respect to where Jimmy came from and how he got the connection with Colin Chapman and the that he drove for thereafter. Uh, so he started something that, that really has had a great legacy and it's great that, that he's part of what's here today um, because if you think of all the drivers that have come out of school. That, I think, is a terrific example going on to win Indianapolis all the number of times he has. Uh, a great many of really these top prime Scottish drivers have come out of the country. I think it's because most of our kind of carry and we're not quite as bullish as some other nationalities. The Scots are well known for that. They were good in the army, they were good in the navy, they were good in the police force. Um, they exported well. So Scotland's probably greatest export is people. Everybody thinks it's Scottish whiskey, but it's really people. So Jimmy and the game of a global person. A lot of grumpy drivers and other people like that and Gary are global. But you had to start somewhere. And really a curious cost. Mr. McCabe's here today. Um, a curious cost have kept that going. And it's very important because we're a wee country, but my God, we've had some great success from it. So let's hope that continues, and let's hope there's a few more Scotch Watsons around. Indeed, absolutely. I can see Andrew Cowan alongside you as well. Of course, success uh, London to Sydney in '68, and he then brought through Louise Eka Walker, who's uh, with us today as well for success. Uh, just about 22 or so years later. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for your time out here. So Jackie, I would uh, just now like you to, to step forward for the unveiling of the, the plaque here. The, the final moments today just to complete this uh, opening ceremony. Uh, just before the unveiling, I'll uh, pass on to, to Duke Nevin just for a, a quick thanks uh, with uh, Sir Jackie just preparing to unveil the, the plaque here. Duke Nevin, of course, uh, the cousin of Jim Clark. Thank you, Stuart. Sir Jackie, um, before we, you, you do the honour, you mentioned the Marcus at Charter Hall, and we thought it'd be apt to give you a, 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 a photograph of you taken by Eric Bryce in 1961, and that's you driving the Marcus. Uh, I hope you'll take that back with you, or we'll send it to you as a reminder. Thank you very much indeed, that's lovely. Gary Feiler was the man who owned that, he was the Scott Watson for me, and he gave me the chance to drive his cars, a Porsche, a Super 90, and then this Marcus, which was a funny wee car, and I won a Charter Hall with it, and it's a Charter Hall, and you can see Charter Hall is so mountainous. Uh, but there I am, I haven't seen that photograph anymore, so that's lovely, thank you very, very much, thank you. So thank you, but uh, before we do the, before we do the, the official bid, we, on behalf of the Scottish Borders Council, Luke Borders and the Jim Clark Trust, we have to thank you for your uh, work that you've done over these years to, to make this possible, and I mean, you came here in 1969 to open the original museum, you came back in, in 1993 when we refurbed the, 
the museum. And here you are again, 50 odd years, again doing it exactly the same. And you've got the same humour and the same go of ideas you had then. And I think it's a great credit to you, the, the way that you carry the, the mantle of Scotland and, and motorsport forward around the world on everyone's behalf. And, uh, and also your personal input into this, because you have come here unnoticed by the world on occasion, and they say at your expense, to, uh, to come and advise us on, on what we should be doing, such as you said, the stone here, Jim would have liked the sandstone. We looked at, as you know, the old high school, and you said, no, this will never be the place for Jim, it has to be back here in this additional stone building, like Edenton Mains. And uh, you were right. And, and you can see by the, the people here today, and we've had over 4,000 people in the last months through this building, and it's thanks to you, and also to all the donors, many of you who are here today, who have helped support to raise the 1.65 million to make this possible. And it's here for everyone to enjoy and carry on the legacy of Jim, which grows and grows around the world. Thank you, sir.